Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Dr. Ramon Chowdhury. I'm general partner and founder of Parity Responsible Innovation Fund and the director of Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency, and Accountability at Twitter. And I'm here, I'm excited to be here moderating today's program. I'm pleased to be joined by Kai Fu Lee, one of the co authors of the new book, AI 2041 10 Visions for Our Future. As CEO of the Beijing based Sinovation Ventures and co chair, of Intelligence Council, along with being a former senior executive at Microsoft, SGI, and Apple, Kaifu is well-versed in the world of AI and what the future holds for the field. In AI 2041, Kaifu Li and his co-author Chen Kifan create an image of what a world with artificial intelligence will look like in 20 years. In 10 gripping short stories, the authors introduce readers to an array of eye-opening concepts, such as a rogue scientist in Munich who uses AI technologies in a revenge plot that endangers the world. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to hear your questions too. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you, Dr. Kai Fu Li, for joining us. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Great to be back. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed your book. It was definitely a marked shift from your first book, AI Superpowers, which in you know the field that we work in definitely sparked a geopolitical and global narrative of what some call the quote AI Cold War. So what led you down the road to speculative fiction? And what do you think the value is of contributing this narrative? Well, yeah, this book is uh, very unique. Uh, many have told me it's one of a kind because it's a mixture of um, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, one reviewer described it as episodes of a uh, optimistic black mirror followed by uh, a McKinsey report. So I'm, I, w- I was the author of the McKinsey part of the book. And then my co-author, uh, Chen Jiufan, uh, wrote the um, optimistic black mirror part. And the reason we wrote it that way was to make really AI understandable and engaging and perhaps even entertaining because it is just too important a technology for really for as many people as possible to understand. And other books are either uh, too technical and also even when they're written to be relatively plain plain language as my last book, AI Superpowers, uh, people still found just the topic AI to be intimidating. So this is an attempt to make it accessible to everyone and see how much our future can change in 20 years, how exciting and challenging it can be, uh, and to be able to reach the largest number of people possible. Yeah, I mean, what, what struck me was, as you've just pointed out, the global nature of this book, which is often something missing from most AI narratives, as well as a, a human first approach. Uh, For example, your first story, The Golden Elephant, is about a young Indian girl who's thinking about her first crush, a globally universal narrative with a decidedly South Asian twist. So, you know, was this intentional to start a story, you know, from the perspective of an individual who would not normally be included or the star of a narrative and definitely not kicking off a book like this? Um, And also as a follow-up, how did you select and gather your narratives? Why did you choose the perspectives you chose? Uh, right. Uh, we really uh, uh, so try to solve a puzzle. Right. We want the 10 stories because the publisher says when you write short stories, do 10. <laughs> it sounds better to have 10 stories, not seven, not 13. So 10 stories we decided up front. And I wanted to put in uh, about 20 technologies uh, uh, in the 10 stories. Some have one, some have two, some have three. So I could analyze them. And they had to be ordered from more some. Uh, simpler to more complex so that those reading my sections can feel like they're learning AI from the basics to the more advanced. Uh, and um, my co-author, uh, Stanley, he, he goes by Stanley, uh, he wanted to have a universal um, coverage, which I really support because AI is not a U.S. or China phenomenon. It will affect the whole world. And, and so, so we picked uh, 10 destinations in the world, 10 countries in the world. And then finally, I wanted it to uh, be in 10 industries 
such as uh, entertainment and uh, healthcare and education, so that when people read all, all of this, they'll see 20 technologies, uh, learn AI, and see that it impacts all industries and all countries. So we fit that all together, and then he started writing one story at a time, and then we interacted on a per-story basis so that the story would include uh, aspects that would uh, push the frontier of AI, uh, raise the questions, and then I would describe how these issues might be solved. Some are solved in the stories, others are more posed as uh, future opportunities. Yeah, and, and I, I see your inner professor and inner instructor coming out here. It seems like a very, really big part of this book was meant to, to educate via sort of these, these narratives um, and not just educate the public, but it seems you're also speaking to maybe tech companies, if I may speculate here. So how can tech companies learn from your stories to engage more global audiences? It's a, it's a huge narrative now. I work at Twitter, every social media company, every major company as they go global, <clears throat> their, you know, their narrative is, how do we talk to communities that are not our typical communities? You know, what, may, what might leaders and tech companies take away from the kinds of narratives and the kinds of individuals that you're shaping in, in these stories? Right. Uh, I think a lot of tech companies, at least especially in the U.S., also in China, think first about the domestic audience. And also sometimes they think about a... Um, typical user, white collar, um, male centric point of view. And that has led to a lot of downside. You know, we know one American company uh, trained their AI, HR AI, based on data that is uh, by far male dominated and ended up not giving equal opportunity uh, to women. Um, and also we, we know there are various um, AI algorithms that didn't have enough coverage for different races so that they work better on one race than another. And that's another form of uh, inequality. So uh, in the story, uh, we deliberately try to cover different aspects. It's in all continents, Australia, Africa, and this also covers um, hopefully gender as well as uh, uh, a racial diversity in a complete way so people can see this truly affects everyone. We show some societies that are very advanced, <clears throat> such as the European one with the uh, overcoming the quantum uh, computer um, technology. And we show some um, societies to be farther behind. The one in India was a little bit behind, but the one in Africa is significantly behind, but still um, the local flavors really uh, require uh, AI technologies uh, are all the same. So we try to uh, present that uh, inclusive picture. Uh, and, and also one last point is that I'm personally very concerned that AI is yet another technology that will exacerbate wealth inequality. And that's wealth inequality among people, uh, among companies, but most importantly, among countries. As larger countries with powerful companies are using user data to create so much value, uh, smaller countries with no technology or poorer countries yet uh, with no technologies uh, essentially are donating user data uh, that are used uh, to make money for the larger countries and larger corporations uh, while the inequality spreads. And as people think about, okay, what can U.S. do about the wealth inequality? Ideas like universal basic income are being explored. In China, we're talking about uh, how to help people who are displaced by AI find another job. Uh, as long as there is enough taxes or contribution from the people and companies who are made rich by AI and other technologies, there is a way to do some degree of income redistribution to take care of the poorer people and make sure they have a buffer if and when their jobs are affected. But the poorer countries won't have the economic means of doing that. So I think it's portraying a global picture and uh, whether it is the um, you know, global uh, collaboration, uh, magnanimity, uh, generosity uh, uh, that solves the problem of, of between countries or, you know, wealthy uh, people like the Gates Foundation taking care of um, uh, reducing the country, the country wealth inequality. I think uh, these need to be called out and that's why they're prominent throughout the book. 
Yeah, the, there, so there's two really important threads in the answer you just gave, which is, you know, really eye-opening. The first part is what myself and others have called algorithmic colonialism, sort of the extraction of data as capital. And as you pointed out, it often, that data often flows from lower income countries to, you know, the more wealthy AI centric countries or where, you know, the countries in which these startups are being built. The second part of what you've pointed out is, you know, almost like the arbitrariness of borders, right? So, you know, as we create a an increasingly globalized economy, an increasingly globalized world, in some cases, and I'm going to put, you know, my personal Silicon Valley hat on for a minute, where sometimes borders really do seem very arbitrary, right? We talk to people all around the world, and we have such a common shared thread and common shared narrative. So, you know, what what is the role of maybe, you know, and maybe this kind of harkens back to your old book of sort of global superpowers in general, in creating that balance between essentially the haves and have nots, to prevent, increasingly prevent the centralization of wealth, not just among countries, but also among literally individuals. Yeah, I think it's all the more important for the individuals to speak out because um, the geopolitics throughout the world is, uh, at least currently, not pulling the countries together to solve the problem, but in many cases, causing uh, conflicts and challenges. So, and I don't, um, pretend to have the wisdom to solve the geopolitical issues. But uh, in the book, what I try to portray is, uh, imagine the future, <clears throat> imagine a future where the cost of goods comes down dramatically because automation replaces human labor for routine work. And the cost of energy comes down significantly due to distributed solar plus new battery storage capabilities. Uh, these are projected to come down dramatically and the cost of goods come, come way down. So if we were a human race that um, all appeared all of a sudden this moment and we were to organize the earth together, it would be very straightforward to say, let's ensure we have enough for everyone because we will. Uh, we were probably not far from it today, but in 20 years, there's no doubt uh, in the last chapter, uh, dreaming for plenitude is a description of a future where there is enough for everyone. Because if we think about this, you know, in, in the past, energy was scarce. Now energy can be manufactured through solar panels and batteries. In the past, labor was um, uh, expensive uh, and are sometimes exploited by capital capitalists. But now uh, labor through automation can have almost a marginal cost of near zero. And we can make all these, and food becomes manufacturable, agriculture becomes manufacturable, energy becomes ag uh, manufacturable, and manufacturing becomes automated through AI. So the cost of goods come down. And how can we as a human race not first think about um, making sure there is enough for everyone? And that really is the takeaway message. You know, the call to action, I think, will depend on the different people and companies and jobs. But, but I think it's a, it's a question about our conscience. Uh, can we possibly feel good about us as human beings who live on this earth that end up watching such disparity uh, between countries? Uh, and as technology, on the one hand, makes everything available <clears throat> for everyone, but at the same time, arbitrary country boundaries still make people suffer when there's really no reason that they should. Absolutely. And, and I think you're also touching on just so many narratives that are ringing true for a lot of folks, whether we're talking about climate refugees, political refugees, um, you know, and, and and again, as you mentioned, sort of the arbitrariness of borders. You know, the last time I would say I've really read an in-depth discussion of what you're talking about, sort of technology reducing the means of uh, the cost of production down to near zero was actually Manu Sadia's Trekonomics. Um, and it seems that, you know, uh, you know, since Star Trek and other sort of positive views of, you know, an AI-enabled future, I can't help but notice that our, you know, currently sort of the, the zeitgeist is decidedly more apocalyptic. So, you know, and you have mentioned that it was an intention to make an optimistic future. So two questions for you. What was behind that intention to write a little bit more optimism into these stories, especially given that today, again, we're surrounded by dystopian narratives of the future. I'd even add even the newer Star Trek Discovery is a decidedly more dystopian view of, of our future. Um, and also, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think we are surrounded by so many narratives of dystopia? <clears throat> right. Uh, I certainly believe in all the issues that technologies could bring up, um, including those for AI, and they are pointed out in the book. Uh, but the reason I introduced um, solutions and described more 
more stories as more positive are threefold. Uh, first, uh, I, I believe if we look back in history, technologies generally do a lot more good than they do uh, bad. And, and the reason uh, fundamentally is that technology is, is, is neutral, but there are more good people and societies and also mechanisms such as uh, the stock market, startup, uh, VC, entrepreneur that tend to push towards positive development. So historically, uh, whether it's electricity, internet, PC, have all led to more good than bad. So I think the same thing will happen for AI, despite some of the recent concerns uh, that people talk about. Uh, the second reason is uh, related, which is I think uh, a lot of the problems raised by technology uh, can and will be solved by technology. For example, we discussed earlier uh, the bias and unfairness uh, that comes from from AI, and, and largely that comes from a, an even distribution of data. And, and that can be fixed by just educating the engineers and also having tools, um, not so different from compiler tools that when you run, uh, train an AI model, checks for a reasonable balance of data between men and women and so on, uh, that can alert to a lot of these um, uh, uh, non-intentional uh, imbalance of data causing inequality. Uh, and also there, uh, for issues like personal data and privacy, there are new technologies in privacy computing, such as federated learning, that could at least partially solve the problem. So a combination of regulation and technology uh, makes me uh, more, more optimistic. And, and the third reason really is that I'm quite concerned about the the negative narrative about AI uh, ballooning to be larger than it needs or should be because they're really constructive signs that should be counterbalanced. And I also think that opinion leaders um, have a responsibility to present balanced views and that um, if, if opinion leaders all become naysayers predicting doom, then what they predict will likely become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I wanted to uh, present a, a cautious uh, future that is optimistic, fraught with danger, but with um, likelihood and uh, uh, it to, that we can solve these dangers. So I do, I I do need to push back on on one part of what you said. So you know, I've been working in the field of algorithmic ethics. I'm actually one of the first people, probably in the world. Um, to work on building product and building solutions in this field. And you know, my team at Accenture built the first bias detection and mitigation tool. And I do wanna push back on the assertion that building tools and educating engineers will solve the problem because I've been at this for years and, and that's that's what we've been doing. And it does, and it's and it, you know, similar to things like self-driving cars, I will I will frame this in a productive question kind of way. Uh, so similar to you know, technologies <coughs> like self-driving cars, it is that last mile that is the hardest, right? So we have the current narrative around uh, automated driving, automated vehicles is that like the 90% or the 95% was solvable. It is that last 5% that's going to take, you know, 40, 50, maybe more years. And I feel it's the same for technology and ethics. And it's that it's that last five to 10% that is about human context, human understanding, um, you know, and so what is the role of, you know, the kinds of narratives you're building. And again, I want to kind of point to, you know, the everyday person in this story and the educational component to this. What value might these stories have in enabling the average person to be able to be part of a conversation around AI, especially as it relates to things like algorithmic ethics and, and bias and, and how biases might affect them? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. These problems are not are not solved. And what I try to do um, in the book and in day, everyday life is to uh, increase the awareness. So, you know, if you look at the AI field, most of the people are excited primarily about working on the next algorithm, right? The, the next uh, pre-trained model, the next transformer, the next convolutional neural network. Not that many of them are thinking about how do I as a researcher uh, devote my professional career to work on new tools and new technologies and advocating a, a uh, responsible education. And also I think we are seeing some educational programs in particular at uh, MIT and Stanford uh, that have raised the issue of uh, AI ethics. And 
and that um, that it's essentially uh, teaching the engineers um, in, in in a way that's not too far from the medical professions Hippocrates oath that they have uh, they are responsible for for this with a great power comes great responsibility and there has been for example at my alma mater uh, Carnegie Mellon a uh, actually balanced incoming class of 50 50 men women in their uh, computer science class so I think efforts are underway and more encouragement is is called for. Uh, so for the for the people going into AI as a scientist or an engineer, these are, I think, what we, I talked about is what I want them to hear about, that they have greater power, therefore need to have greater responsibility uh, because the, the uh, impact that they will have, the, the code they develop will have in the world. And then for the other people who are not in the AI industry, well, I think they should keep their eyes open and become either an advocate or a watchdog uh, for issues uh, that AI may be causing and then uh, raising first watch out for themselves that they don't become a victim of these um, uh, AI ish, technology issues. Secondly, raise awareness. Uh, just as in the first story uh, taking place in India, it ends up with the, uh, the, the, the two, the, the girl and the boy deciding that they were going to make the world aware that this um, uh, giant company is doing things that uh, gets in the way of their lives and that uh, companies and, and designers should, uh, should be responsible and uh, uh, cautious and, and watch for those kinds of things. So I think, I think that's what we uh, should, should uh, have more people do. And this book is intended so that people can understand technology and technology issues to a degree so that they can be watching uh, for that and having conversations and making more people aware of these issues. Absolutely. And, you know, and, You've you've very correctly sort of <clears throat> talked about the power structure and the power dynamic that exists. Um, and education is great, and education is certainly useful. What I find in my role at Twitter and in, in my previous role at Accenture is what people what they ask for next is, well, what do I do? Like engineers will ask, what do I do? So you know, yes, there is the moral imperative of getting people educated and getting smart, but you know. What about, as you alluded to earlier, companies, VCs, you know, I, I run a fund, you run a fund. Uh, so might any of this be linked to your work in Cinnovation Ventures? Is there room for funding companies that think deeply about addressing the issues that are raised in your book? Or, or you know, does this sort of lie purely in the world of fiction um, and speculation? Um, no, I think all of us uh, have uh, a responsibility in this. As an investor, we're very cautious about the companies we invest in, uh, treat their data uh, uh, properly and seriously. And, and uh, there are also new legal uh, requirements that come up in all the countries. And as a part of uh, World Economic Forum, AI Council, we are advocating uh, the, the need to ensure personal data uh, protection. Uh, and, and also, um, I think large companies uh, need to become aware. Uh, and I think it's uh, gradually happening. Um, there are various things large companies can do. Uh, for example, uh, there are many issues. One, one is that we talk about the, the fairness issue, personal data issues, um, but there are also uh, issues related to, uh, for example, uh, AI job displacement. And in that case, uh, you know, Amazon actually has a program that helps their people who are doing routine work, uh, the Whole Food uh, cashiers and the uh, Amazon warehouse pickers. Um, I think, you know, Amazon management knows about what time these people will be replaced out of their routine jobs. So they're beginning training programs that uh, offer as much as $48,000 in four years for the people in these jobs to retrain themselves to move on to uh, a technology that is uh, much less likely to be displaced by AI. So I think everyone, corporations, uh, investors, governments, um, uh, engineers, and, and people who make software tools uh, all have a part to play in this. Yeah, and that, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, sort of the future of work. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of your work with the World Economic Forum has sort of talked about the future of jobs and, and imagining a future society. 
it also seems to be a common thread between your first book and this book and specifically discussed in your story, The Job Savior. Um, and I remember when I first started in Responsible AI in around 2017, you know, the future of work was the biggest narrative. What has been, you know, sort of the change you may have seen over the past few years? I remember there's sort of constantly these narratives of, you know, AI will replace X, whether it's radiologists, doctors, lawyers, secretaries, bus drivers, you name it, everyone was going to be replaced. Um, do you think that that narrative Narrative has evolved and matured? And if so, how has the future of work narrative evolved and matured? Uh, I think first people are realizing that jobs are not just uh, one thing. People in, in each person's job, there are many aspects each uh, of combination of tasks and, and some tasks and it's tasks that are displaced by AI, not the full jobs. And I think uh, whether we think about career planning or, or AI software design, uh, that's, that, that I think is the direction that is, is going. Uh, for example, in the field of uh, uh, robotic process automation, RPA, uh, we are not seeing it exactly one-to-one one -one displacement. We're seeing a pool of workers, let's say a customer service rep or someone who does expense reports, uh, that RPA will follow the person's work and identify for the pool of workers what percentage, what types of tasks can be taken over by AI with a comparable accuracy and fidelity and then proceeds to do so. Um, and the management can replace the 30% uh, with the AI, with the people doing doing the 70% that AI cannot do. But, uh, but as we think about that, we shouldn't think that uh, there is not a job displacement, right? The, the very easy argument is, oh, look, it's just doing tasks. All of our people move on to new tasks. But what if there are no new, no, no new tasks? What if you have a pool of workers who do expense reports and 30%, um, 40%, eventually 90, 100% are being done by RPA, uh, the, the job is being uh, one step at a time a challenge and people are being pushed to the corner so that there is absolutely job displacement happening, uh, looking at uh, one pool at a time. So in the past few years, I would say for white collar jobs, routine jobs, uh, we are seeing RPA as the um, number one technology. You came from Accenture, so you know all about that. And we're <clears throat> seeing more AI beginning to be added to it. And I was just recently in a, visiting a company who was probably using RPA, and uh, they purposely left all the people whose jobs had been displaced, uh, they le purposely left all the PCs still running. So it's quite uncanny to walk in a room of 200 PCs that are basically running by itself, uh, generating chats, clicking, copy, pasting from spreadsheets. So I think that to a, to someone who's less knowledgeable about technology uh, definitively answers the question that AI absolutely uh, displaces jobs um, in, in the white collar. And I think that will take place faster than the U.S. than other countries. And I think COVID, uh, work from home, will accelerate that because it creates uh, data uh, from the workflow and it will make clear to management what types of jobs are automatable and it will happen um, um, to, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the coming uh, years as many jobs that were furloughed may not come back because either they were unnecessary or they've been outsourced or they've been automated. Uh, in China, let me uh, give you a different, um, <clears throat> different view. Uh, if what began as a social distancing um, and, and COVID response, uh, we are seeing um, robotics uh, taking place very rapidly. So more on the blue collar side, uh, we've invested in a number of companies that uh, can do things like uh, 100 times the uh, speed up in terms of COVID, automatic COVID tests. And, and that is the um, primary reason how China manages to uh, test the entire population of the city in two or three days is through these robotic uh, machinery. And then once that's, that, that's developed, uh, the entrepreneurs quickly find that, wow, the lab technician's work can largely be displaced. Uh, it's not the iPhone manufacturing facilities that are automated because those are tough, requiring a lot of uh, hand-eye coordination and dexterity. But it's actually the technician's, laboratory technician's job 
whether it's in drug discovery or uh, tests that are being executed. So entrepreneurs with VC funding are looking for uh, particular types of um, activities that our robotics can solve. And we're seeing uh, more and more restaurants in China adopting robotic graders, you know, not human humanoid waiters, but trays on wheels, respectively, so that you help yourself. Initially, for the reason of COVID response, reducing social, dis, uh, improving social distancing, but now becoming, uh, and then becoming just a uh, fun attraction that people want to sit down and, and try it. Uh, and then now it's becoming a cost saver. Uh, and, and we're also seeing um, many household uh, uh, robots uh, way beyond the vacuum cleaning beginning to happen. So I think, you know, China will probably lead on taking manufacturing robotics uh, in, into new heights, displacing uh, routine blue collar work, while the U.S. will do more through RPA and other technologies on the white collar side. So uh, to your point uh, on robot waiters, a Heidelau opened near uh, where I live. Uh, uh, and yes, the, the robot waiter is definitely a very big bonus. They have an adorable little robot that goes around and, and brings you your food. Um, and you do talk in your book, especially in the, the chapter on healthcare, about the role of COVID-19 and sort of accelerating some of this. Um, so, you know, to talk very specifically about the use of AI in healthcare, that has probably been, you know, some of the most salient narratives in terms of, you know, uh, disparate impact and inequality and potential for biases. Well, what are your thoughts on, first of all, you know, COVID furthering the need for AI in, in other spheres, but also specifically AI in healthcare, as, you know, I think the issues with COVID has definitely highlighted. Right. So long term, I'm incredibly optimistic that uh, healthcare is already gathering all the data that's never, many of which never existed before. And that data becomes fuel for AI. So the, the, the future is full of hope in coming up new ways for healthcare. And that data includes uh, data from our wearable, wearables, uh, computing, and also from uh, genetic sequencing, multiomics as well as uh, full body blood, um, uh, blood, blood tests, including markers, uh, and the full body uh, MRI. Uh, I'm, for my health exam, I actually do all of the above every year, and the data is gathered longitudinally so that it can compute, you know, where have I uh, aged too much, where have I developed problems, and also how I do uh, to other people who are in similar age and conditions, and then give advice as to how I can improve. But also I think collecting this data longitudinally over the next five to 10 years, new methods of treatment and diagnosis will definitely be developed uh, that will significantly uh, improve uh, people's uh, survival rate, as well as the likelihood of uh, being cured of whatever illness that they may have. Uh, just because of all this data cannot possibly be taken into account by any a human physician. But this is a long road because there are many issues involved gathering the data, dealing with sensitive personal information, um, and also uh, uh, legal uh, malpractice laws and accountability and people's unwillingness to be treated by an AI doctor. So I'm fully aware that this could take 30 or 40 years to be uh, fully embraced. But I also have no doubt that AI will be uh, one domain at a time, let's say uh, you know, lung cancer radiology, followed by uh, general radiology, followed by different aspects of illnesses, uh, and then eventually to become a general practitioner's assistant that will have much higher accuracy that in the beginning, it is um, uh, merely a tool for the physician to use, to consider, to consult with, or that he or she can use or ignore as they feel. But in the, as it develops, improves on data, it will become so accurate that I think physicians will feel like they need a compelling reason to override the AI result. So I really see this developing over the next 30 or 40 years, becoming uh, eventually reshaping the way people are treated, uh, dramatically improving our health and longevity. Uh, but in the near term, I also see low-hanging fruits. Uh, AI doctor's assistant is just merely one of them. That's still difficult to, uh, to use uh, because 
physicians have to feel comfortable and patients have to feel comfortable. Uh, so I think the biggest, biggest near-term opportunity are areas where this doesn't really uh, have any friction with existing medical practices. So one example is uh, drug discovery because drug discovery is simply an isolated process of finding new drugs. And uh, once it's once the new drug is proven safe by clinical trials, it will go to market and then uh, fit into the entire medical chain with no requirements to change anything. So if AI can reduce the cost of drug discovery, it, it can have a tremendous uh, benefit. We've all read about uh, AlphaFold from DeepMind. Uh, one of our portfolio companies called In Silico Medicine has, has done the other thing, which is once the protein is folded, um, it can uh, take a pathogen and find a target and then fit a suitable molecule, that uh, small molecule solution that could solve the disease. And this has been tried in, in, in 20 or 30 different uh, drug discoveries, which are in progress, two of which are now in clinical trial. And in these two, we are seeing parts of the process being uh, 10 times uh, cheaper and three times faster. So what this will lead to is uh, a, a more drugs discovered that can treat rare diseases that are not economical for pharmaceuticals to, to look at right now. Uh, we are also seeing um, uh, and the company we funded in uh, pharmacy benefit management, they've been able to accumulate data legally uh, with the consent of uh, uh, users who want to file for insurance and get the best drug possible. We're getting phenomenal data based on the efficacy of the drugs. And I think that can push diagnostics uh, further without impacting or changing the, um, the entire space. Uh, the last example is uh, AI longevity because longevity is not really a field of medicine. Uh, perhaps it should be, but isn't. And because it isn't, AI can push and do a lot more because it's not uh, uh, hurting anyone's job or changing any uh, existing stringent process. So as an example, the clinic that I go to for health exams uh, goes through an ex extensive uh, data collection uh, comparison with other people, uh, and then giving me very solid advice, uh, of course, approved and selected by a physician that's been helping my, my personal blood measure to become six years younger than when I started this um, practice. So you can see huge progress can be made if AI were able to be run along, uh, alone without impacting other processes and in an area that uh, is uh, only net positive with no downside for the people. So in a, a little bit of a switch from maybe the physical to the, the virtual, um, you know, one another story that really stood out to me was My Haunting Idol, which is about AR and VR. I know we've had a few narratives. Ready Player One is probably the most uh, currently well-known version. Um, and actually in your, your follow-up, your, your, your McKinsey style write-up, as you put it, about it, you talk about, you know, the power of Pokemon Go and, and, you know, what it did for folks when it first came out. So one might say this technology is really starting to take off. It's taken a little bit of time, uh, but we're seeing companies double down, especially with Facebook, you know, and, and their concept of, of the metaverse, for example. So since you're sort of giving this global, ethical, humanistic perspective to a lot of these technologies, what do you think, what do you think are the pressing questions? Questions that we should consider in this new frontier of human interaction, whether we call it the metaverse or whatever, um, and how does how do your stories address them? Yeah, I I actually started working on VR in the '90s, way before its time, and what I've learned is that first it has to become extremely uh, comfortable for people people to wear. So I think VR and AR will take off when the devices are uh, no, no more cumbersome than say these uh, glasses that people can use. And then the experience has to be very vivid, lifelike, uh, and, and, um, and can't make you dizzy. So by projecting further, probably would be another five to 10 years until that can happen. I, I think the experience through a phone is the natural first um, instantiation, but I don't think it provides the immersive, compelling um, 
user experience that will push a majority of people uh, into it. So I think Facebook is doing great experiments, but I think the future uh, will be will happen when we don't have the giant, uh, you know, uh, head, head mounted display and we can actually have glasses or even contact lenses that can be good enough. So that's a bit farther away, I believe. The current uh, hype uh, metaverse, I think is, um, we've seen this many times. Uh, we actually saw it uh, about five years ago and I saw it personally about uh, 25 years ago. And, and I think we, I think I just, I think the first thing is, as I mentioned, the, 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 the peripherals have to be very natural. But the second big issue is I think we shouldn't take this too far. This vivid environment, it provides a great place for entertainment and games. There's no doubt about that. To extrapolate and say that there will be a social experience, whether it's between people and people uh, or people and AI life, if you will, I think that's a bit um, uh, longer term. I think we need a lot more experimentation. So my prediction is um, that uh, 3D immersive environment will take off five to 10 years from now. Uh, it will uh, have uh, be an instant success in entertainment. And then social and other applications will take a bit longer to develop uh, because they're not absolutely a, a, a given right now. Um, so in the story, we talk about 20 years uh, away so we can take a little bit more of a, a freedom to project what could happen. Uh, I, I believe in a 20 year time frame, it should be possible to develop uh, basically AI in that environment that is very much like human uh, interface, whether you want to uh, bring Albert Einstein back to life or play a game or interact with uh, historical figures, uh, I think it should be doable in that uh, 20 year time frame. And a lot of that builds upon the recent advances uh, in visual and spoken and natural language uh, advances, which the chapter talks about. Uh, we've all heard about uh, AI in GPT-3 or Transformer or BERT or Google's uh, new um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Lambda dem demonstration. So I think the ability to uh, uh, copycat humans will is significantly advanced that certainly in a um, um, five to 10 year time frame that will be uh, very high quality in text and speech. And in 20 years, uh, we can probably make digital humans that are indistinguishable from people passing the Turing test in many ways. Uh, they don't have self-awareness or true emotions, but they can emulate us well enough to make such experiences possible. Um, and, and I'm glad you kind of raised that sort of the gap between passing the Turing test and actually you know, being a human versus emulate. I appreciate your, your use of the word emulating. Um, and, you know, so many of the stories in, in your book make reference to the ethical and social issues. Uh, and I know we've talked about them a little bit today as well. And as a, a longtime advocate for these causes, I'm really glad to see the, the discussion. Um, do you feel there's sufficient work happening in these fields today? And if you were to take a magic wand and maybe change something about the state of tech with, in, in relationship to these issues, what might you change? Uh, I would find ways for the smartest people to gravitate towards the biggest problems we need to solve in AI ethics. And, and whenever that happens uh, in history, uh, problems are much more likely to be solved. So you know, instead of contests to see who can do better on reading comprehension tests, can we have tests on who can build fair AI or um, and also who can work on new ways of privacy computing that allows us to have our cake and eat it too, to be able to train powerful AI without giving up one's personal data, uh, at least not to one global giant. Um, and, and also I would like to see not just technological advances, but new experiments. I think the current thinking about how to, how to control the uh, internet giants are are too crude, you know, splitting up a company and things like that. I think there can be uh, measures to improve uh, their uh, adherence to our longer term needs. So the problem really, uh, a lot of the problem comes from internet giants that want to please their shareholders and themselves by using AI to maximize um, uh, revenue or profits, but um, what they 
should really think about is, can there be an opportunity for them to really fulfill the human longer term need and use AI for that? Wouldn't that make them even more money? For example, can we measure humans, um, each person's uh, level of improvement in their knowledge or uh, can they be having more fun um, in a positive, constructive way or can they become happier? If these can be measured in the longer term, then new business models will naturally uh, cause them to have their interests aligned with the user. This is not so far-fetched um, as it may sound. For example, today, uh, Netflix has a business model close to this because they're measured by how users watch for the long term. Do they watch a mini series to its end? Do they follow season to season? Thereby at least creating a long-term uh, measure um, and, and they're funded, uh, they use the, uh, the, the users basically vote with their feet. If they like the shows, they keep paying. If they don't like it, they walk away. Uh, unlike a lot of today's uh, internet companies, uh, through no fault of their own, except the business model that they chose to use, uh, correlates um, user minutes and eyeballs with revenue. And that correlates with earnings per share. And that causes them to keep optimizing um, uh, their, their revenue, sometimes at the expense of the users. So thinking more about Netflix-like model, uh, and maybe VCs can do that, entrepreneurs can do that. Uh, I mean, I as an end user would gladly pay a lot of money for a social media uh, that um, makes me better. Uh, rather than uh, gets me to click. So I think those kinds of encouragement can be helpful as well. So I want to move to the audience questions uh, just to make sure we have a lot of input from folks and, and please keep sending in your questions uh, if you're listening into the, to the conversation. Um, similar, we just got a question, you know, to continue the, the vein on which you're talking about. Uh, do you worry that the profit motive is driving AI companies to go straight to inventing warp drive when they should start with the wheel? Uh, yes, in fact, I think that is very much addressing um, uh, uh, addressing the la la last question I raised. Although I'm not sure I would use warp drive and wheel as the comparison. Um, I, I think there's maybe um, uh, a warp drive, uh, uh, that makes the maker of the warp drive make a lot of money, but doesn't get me to the place I want to. A warp drive that gets me to the place in the next minute, but doesn't get me to the place I want to be in, in the next destination. So I think it's not a wheeled warp drive, but a warp drive that aligns the, um, you know, because our interests don't change. All of us want to be happier, smarter, etc. cetera, uh, then, uh, why couldn't and should an internet company align their warp drive to get us to where we want to be rather than what gets them a better quarterly report? So I would, um, and, and I think it's a challenging problem because anyone who's already got a money printing engine uh, like the internet companies today, it's harder for them to change. So maybe it is up to, to us who are uh, in VC and entrepreneurial space to think about what is a longer term interest aligned warp drive that allows AI to make us better and at the same time make company make the company building this warp drive um, uh, wealthier, richer as well. That's a really fascinating take, and and I, I suppose I'll I'll ask you a bit more about what VCs and entrepreneurs can do. So you know I'm uh, also <laughs> part of movements and sit on boards to help organizations uh, and companies start off on the right foot. One such group is called Startups in Society, um, based out of New York, and they're they're really helping entrepreneurs be responsible and ethical. Uh, and overall, and overwhelmingly, the feedback we hear is that, well, you know, this seems to be at odds with what I'm being pressured to do by, by the VCs, uh, by shareholders, sort of its growth at all costs and the ethics part is nice. Uh, then how do we as funders change the mentality of our cohort and the people that we know? What, what, what's our response and what can we do? Yeah, I, I, I would say uh, on the one hand, we should look for these balanced initiatives. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the VC and entrepreneur community is, it works because of the model of um, uh, increasing funding, increasing valuation. So anything that holds it back can be unnatural. So I would look for ways that doesn't hinder the growth engine 
of entrepreneurial ecosystem. For example, uh, everything else being equal, a subscription-based direction tends to be better than advertising faith funded direction. So hopefully there's more, more thinking on the former and that in itself shouldn't lose any money from our LPs to which to whom we have to owe our allegiance, primary allegiance to. So that's an example. Um, I think there's other activities we can take. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier about a watchdog. That's not so much a VC activity, but uh, we, we could philanthropically um, support and help organizations that could be governmental, could be third party, uh, it could be a, um, a, a ESG activity that basically rates, um, you know, internet companies based on their percentage of complaints or, or, or um, fake news or other things that are bad for people and then kind of force them to improve those numbers uh, and uh, and uh, and in doing so, helping their brand. And in, if they keep scoring bottom every month, it will hurt their brand and brand loyalty. And also, perhaps connected to the future of corporate ESG, so that shareholders may not want to buy their stock if they're ranked lowest on fake news. So I think all these activities, uh, not all of which are directly related to our work. I think I see you know ninety percent of my work still focused on helping entrepreneurs become successful and make money, but do so in a business model that's more likely to lead to a positive outcome. And then maybe 10% of my time is on a non-profit making activities to push the edge of responsibility and sustainability. Absolutely. And, you know, to echo your point, we're seeing some of the seemingly canonical narratives, for example, the privacy paradox, as they used to call it, being actually completely destroyed as we see better tools enabled for users to make that choice. So for folks in the audience who aren't familiar, the privacy paradox is, you know, what folks used to say when people were debating uh, revenue models. And, and the narrative was, everybody says they want privacy, but people want stuff for free as well. So, you know, if you, if you try to move to a subscription model, it doesn't work because, you know, people will just freely share their data for free stuff uh, and or they don't want to engage with the windows and tools required to protect your data. But, you know, now we're seeing, uh, you know, Apple making it a lot more seamless to rescind your use of data. And we're seeing overwhelmingly, this is what people are choosing to do. Uh, you know, so, so I personally, and I, I agree with you, I think there is, a light on the horizon where as people get smarter from the bottom up, you know, things that your book AI 2041 seeks to do as they start to internalize these narratives, they're starting to raise their hand, ask the right questions and, you know, and prompt for and use the tools that are being provided to them. And it's our job to make those tools available to people. Um, so back to the audience questions, um, you know, back to the future of work. Um, Whose responsibility should it be to retrain or help place workers being displaced by AI, the government or companies themselves, and why? Well, I personally think the government has to play a stronger role. Uh, as much as I uh, applaud what Amazon has done in retraining their workers that are likely to be displaced into jobs that Amazon may not even offer like nurses and truck drivers. Uh, but I think most companies will not have the financial means to do that. Uh, and so I think the governments uh, really need to start thinking about this. And I think the challenge for the governments is usually they, until they see unemployment become a problem, uh, they won't really act on it. And unemployment pre-COVID hasn't been very bad. And then post-COVID is masked by COVID, so it's hard to tell how bad it is. So as much as I like to see more governments become more proactive, get ahead of this issue, uh, they are not because they're, in their opinion, um, a, sh a shorter term urgent issues they need to address. Uh, so, uh, but even then, I think there are some things that just can't uh, that doesn't cost anything for governments to look at. For example, uh, and not just governments, but any, any entity that's dealing with vocational training. So whether it's a social security-like office asking people to get retraining or maybe a community college or vocational school that may not be governmental, they should think about revisiting what are the jobs they want vocational training for. Because even with or without AI, some things are becoming quite obvious. The job of an auto mechanic will shift in the next 10 years as cars become electrical and later automated. Uh, some jobs, um, 
while still a similar routine uh, work, will probably stay okay, such as a plumber. And some jobs will probably increase in number, such as nurses and um, uh, healthcare service professionals, because people live longer and need more more care. So I think a little bit of a future uh, planning and then integrating that into vocational schools is something that can and should be done now. It doesn't require unemployed numbers to get that going. Absolutely. Um, so here's a really interesting question. Some projections call for tens of trillions of dollars in capital to reverse and or stop the effects of climate change. Do you worry this will harm or strangle capital that would otherwise be available to tech or AI companies? Uh, well, I'm very you know, pro, pro climate, pro changes, because these will make sure we have a future to look forward to. Otherwise, uh, there is no future. Uh, also, I think there are, so, so again, I think interest alignment is, is quite important. Uh, 10 years ago, it was very hard to push for climate efforts because the, it's purely a cost center. But nowadays we're seeing, you know, solar becoming uh, in, for many places, a lowest cost of energy. And we just need to figure out how to use it in a distributed kind of way. For example, for your building, for your factory, or for your commercial uh, space. Uh, and, and I think now there is a way to look at this as a win-win. That is, you're contributing to the, uh, the good of the world and also saving money once you put in some initial investment. So I'm actually uh, quite optimistic that with this interest alignment, uh, more, more positive uh, uh, steps will, will, will follow. And, and also I think US and China, while there are geopolitical issues, uh, do seem to, to, to see eye to eye on this issue. And with the two giants uh, working uh, at least in alignment, if not uh, together, uh, I think this will be much better than it was a few years ago. Absolutely. Um, so, so slightly different question. Uh, compared to your previous work at Microsoft and Google, what do you like the most about Cinovation Ventures and what do you miss about working inside big tech companies? Yeah, well, working in a big company, uh, you get a whole platform. There's so much corporate learning uh, that about knowledge industries directions that you wouldn't necessarily get in the public domain. So I, I miss working with so many smart people in so many areas um, because we're a much smaller company uh, and also uh, having a platform. If you have a great product, the platform can often make it great without you having to uh, work so incredibly hard and maybe face challenges. Uh, what I like about the smaller Sinovation platform is that as a, a venture capital firm that invests in about 40 companies per year, we really get to see the cutting edge and work with entrepreneurs who, um, who basically control their destiny. And, and I think you know, smaller companies, tech companies are our future whatever country we, we're in. And, and, and also I think, my, uh, I think my impact is amplified through these 40 uh, companies per year that we not only invest in, but, but help them uh, make a positive impact uh, to the world. So I think if you measure someone's impact as the metric, I would say perhaps at a larger company, the total absolute impact may be larger because I have the platform, but I need to think about in a large company, is it really me or is it a company? Uh, the company probably do just as well with another executive in place, but in Sanovation, where I and our, our small team is hand selecting the companies we work with, the, our success or failure will largely because of what we do, not because of the platform on which we stand. And I think that uh, is a degree of uh, uh, control of my destiny and a feeling of a stronger sense and ownership and agency uh, that I personally treasure more. I could not agree with you more. I think there's something incredibly exciting about being part of the the building, uh, you know, and, and especially as somebody who gets to, you know, cultivate the next generation of leaders. I'm, I'm sure that part is incredibly exciting as well. Um, so a question kind of related to what we were talking about earlier about healthcare, um, you know, and the potential for AI in 
in industries like healthcare, and we're talking a lot about data collection, um, what protection is part of is part of using tech is available for using technology to identify people, and what prevents profiling? So, you know, what, what protections do people have, and, and what can individuals do to prevent identification if they don't want identification? Right. I think every country will have somewhat different standards, and what's important is to as much as possible, give people a choice. So say healthcare as an example, um, in ordinary times, uh, people uh, should have the capability of uh, anonymizing. Just like you know, on the internet, we can choose to use HTTPS and we can choose to not let Google have our profile. That should be made possible so that people who really don't, who really don't want to trade uh, their personal information for convenience can, can, can do that. That's not always possible because uh, taking COVID as an example, uh, in many Asian countries, contact tracing is uh, mandatory. And, and that makes uh, uh, perhaps some people uh, uncomfortable, but I, I think um, you know countries try to do what fits the culture. I think the Asian culture tends to accept uh, security uh, as a higher priority than personal data protection. So they have worked uh, effectively. And after the COVID is over, uh, presumably the, the contact tracing will end. So we'll uh, uh, see if that, that, so that has helped Asia, I think in general, control COVID better. But at the same time, we see Europe and US are not able to implement the contact tracing because people, too many people don't want that. And I think, Despite having more COVID cases, I would guess most people in Europe and the U.S. feel that's a reasonable trade-off in order to have um, that personal protection. So it's a tricky issue because uh, in an ideal world, well, we we want you know each country to use what's suitable for the great majority of the people and allow the small percentage who don't like to opt out. But COVID is an example where we probably can't do that. So there's no perfect solution. Um, but um, but hopefully countries and individuals will uh, you know make the right choices. Absolutely. Um, so we're reaching the point in the program where there is time for I'll say two last questions. So the flip side of the same question. The first one came from the audience. Um, what worries you the most about the future of AI? Is there anything about it that keeps you up at night? <clears throat> well, I worry about all the issues we discussed. Um, uh, you know, AI fairness, transparency, personal data, security. Uh, but probably what worries me the most is the uh, potential dangers of aut autonomous weapons. And, and not only used by countries in warfare, but also by terrorist groups. And uh, what worries me more is that despite many efforts, such as uh, thousands of AI scientists, uh, including uh, Elon Musk and the late Stephen Hawking, speaking up, uh, for countries and for to, to look at this cautiously, uh, people have not chosen to uh, to take to to, uh, to to take this seriously. What this is likely to lead to is an autonomous weapon 9/11, and that surely will wake people up. But it's um, sad to see that um, it will take such a um, disaster to to for people to wake up. But um, but but I think we do need to to look at this seriously. So in the in the spirit of the the feel of your book and your desire for you know a positive discussion, not more optimistic discussion, or actually the word you used was balanced. What makes you the most excited about the future of AI now that we've talked about what worries you the most? Uh, I'm most excited about the use of AI in healthcare. Uh, I think you know robotics and other things can improve our productivity, save us time. But uh, I, I feel personally that the field of medicine, uh, while I respect all the practitioners greatly, uh, they could not have developed it in any other way than essentially a, a trial and error practice uh, with science tagged on later as an afterthought. Uh, I think we have an opportunity to use a data-centric power of AI to really reinvent the field of medicine that can make us more uh, live healthier and, and longer. And, uh, and, and that's the one resource that you know, we can't alter, you know, we can try to make ourselves you know, more productive, productive, more knowledgeable, um, but we can't help ourselves live healthier and 
longer with the current state of medicine and, and with healthcare becoming digitized with so many ideas blossoming. And also on top of AI and data, there are huge advances in um, um, genetics, in um, synthetic biology, in other areas of life sciences that I feel we're really going to have a new chapter that can, um, can rethink about our, our health and, it, and it's an area that uh, has almost no downside. It has lots of reasons for global uh, participation. So I'm very hopeful that in uh, 20 years, maybe a little bit longer, we can really see dramatic advances. Maybe we'll live to be 20, 30 years longer. Maybe we can still be functional longer. So uh, you know, at my age, that's uh, more important. Absolutely. Um, and actually, maybe to ask you a bit of, a, bit of an off the wall question, since we are talking quite a bit about healthcare, and, and I think you're right, there's a lot of focus in Silicon Valley uh, and just investment in general and tech into healthcare, but not just specifically healthcare, but all, but quite literally sort of hacking the human body. Uh, so maybe a, very, a bit of a, a curveball question to end it with is, uh, if you could be immortal, would you? No, I think our life okay. is defined by our mortality. Uh, I'd like to live another 20 years. That would be great. Healthily for another 20 years. That would be uh, the most I would, I would want. Um, my, I, I think there are my, 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 my children and then the, our next generation to carry things on. It would be a very unnatural. I think, in fact, um, we, we could have existential questions if people were allowed to become immortal. Negative Absolutely. outcome. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and these are the kinds of like sort of Back and forth. I loved our conversation today because of the, the the way we can, you know, sort of go seamlessly between the philosophical questions of if you could choose immortality, what would it mean? All the way to, you know, very practically and pragmatically, what do we do about hiring biases and the automation of jobs? So, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Kaifu Lee, for joining us today and you know, discussing your new book, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Dr. Man Chowdhury. Thank you. Stay safe and stay healthy.